Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, God. We give it up to you, Jesus. We give everything to you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Take everything away. I just want you. That should be the desires of our hearts. As believers in Christ Jesus, we should want more of God every day in our lives. So we're going to go ahead and, and uh, open up in a word of prayer, and then we're going to get into our lesson tonight. We're going to uh, begin with the last chapter. We made it to the last chapter of the book, The Battlefield of the Mind. What an awesome privilege it is to make it this far, it's teaching and studying this book. God has really been enriching my spirit and my mindset. It's been changing quite a bit. Ever since I started teaching this word from the Battlefield of the Mind, I've been seeing a change in my own life and hearing testimonies of other people, how this lesson have impacted their life with the revelation, knowledge, and the wisdom God has given me to teach his people. So I thank you for tuning in tonight, those of you who are on right now. God bless you again. Thank you, Pastor Hal, for joining tonight. Thank you, uh, my, my neighbor, Eric, my friend. God bless you, bro. Um, let's open a word of prayer. Grace God and Father, we thank you for this opportunity to break the bread of life once again. We thank you, Lord God, for the word that you speak to our hearts by divine revelation, empower us, change us, inspire us to live a fruitful and a free life in Christ Jesus. Forgive us for our sins, anoint and unknowingly God, and wash us in the blood of the Lamb, purify our thoughts and our actions. Let us be, have a free conscience to hear you, Father God, from the heart of God. Speak your word until our spirits bring change in our lives for eternity. And I thank you, Lord God, that those who hear this word, even those who hear after tonight, Father God, hear this word that will bring a change in their lives, oh God, will help them grow in grace and in the knowledge of who you are. And I give you praise, I give you thanks. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you, Lashonda. Thank you for joining. My fiance. Amen. I want to read something. Tonight we're going to talk about I'm going to do it my way or not at all. We started last week a little bit in this book dealing with the stubbornness of Israel, how how they were so rebellious towards God. Every time God delivered them from one situation because of their rebellious ways and their stubbornness, they end up right back in the entrapment of their enemies in a place of captivity because they chose to keep on giving in to the sinful nature and rebelling against God's truth and God's divine order. So tonight I want to read, what does the Bible say about rebellion? What does the Bible say about rebellion? There's a website called Got Questions, and you can look that website up, Got Questions, gotquestions.org, and it has a lot of enriching uh, information on that website that will help open your understanding to a lot of biblical discussions and questions you may have concerning the Word of God. So what does the Bible say about rebellion? Amen. Rebellion is the is opposition to authority. Rebellion is the opposition to authority. Rebellion can become violent as in an armed rebellion uh, as in armed rebellion broke out in the city, but it can also remain un, un, unexpressed. So in other words, you can have rebellion and not express it, but you still have a heart of rebellion. Rebellion always begins in the heart. Rebellion against God's authority was, hu was humanity's first sin in Genesis chapter 3 and continues to be our downfall and our sinful nature do not want to bow down to the authority of another, even God. We want to, want to be our own bosses. And the rebellion in the human heart is the root of all sins. And you find it in Romans chapter 3 verse 23. said, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Because of the heart of mankind is so sinful, God knows our heart. He knows the desires of our heart. He knows when we're going to obey and when we're going to disobey. But he, he gives us a choice. One thing about God, he loves us so much, he will not violate your will. So if you choose to walk in rebellion, to be stubborn, to be an idol worshiper, it doesn't matter what you choose to do to go against God, God going to let you do it. He don't, care. he don't care what you do. Because he knows that one day you have to meet the king for yourself. 
either you're going to repent now and get your life right with the Lord, or you're going to meet the Lord in the end in judgment when you stand before the beamer seat of Christ, the judgment of Christ, and be judged because of your sinful nature. The clearest demonstration in the Bible of rebellion and its consequences is found in 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 3. It's a King Saul chosen by God to lead Israel. So he disobeyed direct to, to he, he, excuse me, correct him. He, for he disobeyed God's direct instructions. First Samuel chapter three, 15, verse 3. Excuse the glitch tonight. The signal is still messing up again. I don't know why it's doing this, but it is uh, freezing up again. Uh, excuse the glitches. I uh, pray that it clear out like it did last week. We're going to trust God. It's going to have clear access to the airways because the enemy is alive. This word is going to get out one way or another. So it says that um, he disobeyed God's inst direct instructions and substituted for his own idea. Instead of following God's directive to destroy all the plunder from the enemy's camp, Saul kept the best of the livestock. Instead of killing the wicked king Agag as God had commanded, Saul brought him back to, as a prisoner. Both, both these acts were in rebellion against God's order, yet Saul was pleased with his initiative and he tried to justify his disobedience. The animals were to be sacrificed to the Lord after all. So, as we find here, Saul was a prime example of rebellion. How God gave him instruction to kill all the, the things in the enemy's camp of the Amalekites, but yet Saul decided I'm going to keep the best of the cattle, I'm going to keep the king alive, because I can use these, these animals to sacrifice to the Lord. So God was not pleased with that. God gave him a specific divine order to do things his way, but Saul decided I'm going to do it my way or I'm not going to do it at all. How many times we find ourselves in the same type of attitude where God gave you instruction to do a particular thing in, in your own life, but yet you didn't follow God's instructions, so it didn't work out. Or you get to the place where, you know what, I hear what God told me to do, but if it can't do it my way, I don't want to do it at all. How many times in a relationship, one or the other had gave you a specific order to do something for the better of the relationship, but you didn't want to do it because you're stubborn. You were stuck on your own prideful ways and arrogant and haughty. So instead of trying to do the please one another, I'm not going to do it at all. I don't care what you say. I'm not going to the bank. I'm not getting no money out the bank. I'm not going to uh, pick the children for school. You can do it yourself. You have free time. It's all types of reasons we can use to justify the reason why we do wrong, but none of it's good in the eyes of God. Stubbornness is, is what the enemy uses in the people of God to keep them in a place of entrapment in the wilderness mentality. The wilderness mentality is a wandering place where you find yourself drifting from the way of truth and the way of righteousness. Amen. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Rebellion against proper authority is a serious matter in God's eyes. The prophet Samuel confronted King Saul with these words. Does not he said, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like an evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. And you'll find this account in 1 Samuel chapter 15. Verse 22 to 23. First Samuel chapter 15, verse 20, 22 and 23. We Rebellion is linked to pride in this passage, and both sins are equated with witchcraft and paganism. Because of Saul's persistence, rebellion against God, he lost the throne and his royal dynasty was cut short. Because he chose to rebel against God, he cut his own, his own uh, uh, plan that God has for his life short. He caused himself to lose his own throne. All these, these different things we can do, we can cause more harm than damage in our lives through rebellion than being obedient. 
God gave the kingdom to a shepherd boy named David, 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14. So it's very important as a child of God to recognize what is it in my heart that's causing me to sin against God? What is it in my heart that's causing me to become stubborn and resistful and rebellious towards God's divine order? God has given me a, a specific instruction. God has given me his word and his precepts and his laws to follow. What is it that keeps driving me away from God's commands? Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. So many times the enemy, he attacks us in our mindsets because if you put a thought in there that's not of God, that thought can dominate, that thought can rule, that thought can lead you astray from the way of truth and righteousness into a pathway of destruction. That's the whole plan of the enemy is to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, I'm coming to give you life and that more abundantly. That they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but might keep his commandments. It might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that has set not their hearts aright, nor prepared their hearts to know God, and whose spirit would not steadfast and faithful to God. Psalm 78, verse 7 and 8. Psalm 78, verse 7 and 8. The Israelites displayed much stubbornness and rebellion during their years in the wilderness, that it is precisely what caused them to die out there in the wilderness. They, they just would not do what God told them to do. They cried out to God to get them out of trouble when they got in a mess. They would even respond to his instruction with obedience until circumstances improved. Then repeatedly, they go right back into rebellion. How many times you found yourself in the same predicament? When you got in a mess, you got into a messed up relationship, got on a job you really don't like, you went to visit folks that you shouldn't have went to visit, and you find yourself right back in a predicament of a mess. So you cried out to God, and God delivered you. As soon as God delivered you from your mess, when things start looking good, you start feeling better about yourself, your self-esteem is being restored because the mess you were in got you feeling worthless, feel like no one cares about you, like what's the use of even living? So once you got out of that mess, then you went right back into the same old predicament, just like a woman in an abusive relationship or a man in an abusive relationship. You cry out for help, to get wisdom. God sends people in your life to lead God and direct you to get out of that situation. And then you find yourself drifting right back into the same old mindset. Go right back to, to the place of a familiar spirit called abuse because you're used to it. When God is trying to bring you out, set you free, instead of maintaining your freedom, you go right back to your spiritual prison of abuse. And then things get worse. You might even get to the point of, of facing death because you rebelled against God and you went right back into the same old mess God told you not to go to. The enemy knows what tactic to use to lure you and to bait you into a place of the wilderness. The enemy knows what to use to entrap you. But it's your choice to maintain your freedom. It's your choice to stay out of darkness. It's your choice to walk in the light of truth. So we talked about this last week. They will repeatedly go back into the same old predicaments God delivered them from. Why? Because it's a cycle. It's a cycle in your mindset that makes you think you have to stay in that same way of living. Even though it's destructive, even though it's hurting, it's destroying your self-esteem, destroying your life, you feel you got to go right back into that same old predicament when God brought you out. I suppose some of us were just by nature a little more stubborn and rebellious than others then, of course, we must consider our roots, how we got started in a life and became and because it affected us the way it did. I was born a strong personality, personality and probably would have spent many years trying to do it my way, no matter what. 
but the years I spent being abused and controlled added to an already strong personality combined together with develop, to develop me in the mindset that nobody was going to tell me what to do in my life. Many times we get in certain predicaments and we've been hurt so much to when you finally start building a callous heart, you get to the place where I don't care what people say, I'm not listening to nobody, I'm gonna live my life the way I wanna live my life, I'm gonna protect myself, I'm gonna guard myself the way I feel the best way to do, cause I'm not gonna let nobody else mistreat me. But then you find yourself going right back into the same old situation again. When God has brought you out, God has delivered you, you find yourself getting right back into the same type of mistakes, doing the same old things you did before that hurt you, the things that caused you to sin against God. You go right back to the same thing. You just like the Arthur said here, spent years of a, in abuse, and because she was already a strong person, a person with a strong personality and strong will, even though subjected to abuse, she decided with herself, you know what? I'm not going to listen to nobody else. I'm not going to let nobody tell me what I need to do with, my, with myself. I'm going to live my life the way I choose to. And I don't care if anybody want to follow me, want anyone want to be with me. I'm going to live my life to the best that I want to live it. Obviously, God has to deal with this bad attitude before he can use me. The same with you and I. God has to deal with our bad attitudes in order to use us in his kingdom. Because humility is the key to success in the kingdom of God. God cannot use you if you have a selfish, hard-hearted, bad attitude. The Lord demands that we learn to give up our own way and be pliable and moldable in his hands. As long as we are stubborn and rebellious, he cannot use us. God cannot use you in the kingdom of God if you're stubborn, you're prideful, you're arrogant, you halt, 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 got haltness in your heart, you're self-righteous, you're indignant. God cannot use you until you allow your defenses to be broken down and you submit yourself to his lordship and authority. And when you submit to his authority, God begins to change your life. This thing is so annoying. But excuse the glitches, everybody. I don't know why it's doing this again, but excuse it, but... We're going to continue anyhow. I describe stubborn as obstinate, difficult to handle or work with, and rebellious as resisting control, resisting correction, unruly, refusing to follow ordinary guidelines. Are you one of those type of people? You're obstinate, you're just stubborn, rebellious, callous, resisting authority, unruly, mean, refusing to follow orders. God is saying to you tonight, you need to let your defense down. So the spirit of the living God can come into your heart and remold you and reshape you the way God wants you to be, just like God when he told Jeremiah the prophet, go down to the potter's house and observe the potter at work at the wheel how he took, took the clay and he molded it as he chose. And that's what God wants to do with our hearts tonight, is take our hearts, remove the things that's in us that's not of him, and begin to reshape us, remold us in his image and his likeness to be just what he wants to be, a vessel to be used for his glory. Both of these definitions describe how I was. The abuse I have suffered in, in my early life caused a lot of out of balance attitudes towards authority. But as I said earlier in the book, I could not allow my past to become an excuse to stay trapped in rebellion or anything else. Victorious living demands prompt, exact obedience to the Lord. You heard it said. If you want to be victorious, to live a fruitful and abundant life in the kingdom of God. A victorious life is only come from your acts of obedience. If you can't obey God's authority, can't let go of your attitude and get Christ's attitude, 
you are going to find yourself always coming up short on the, on the stick because you never measure up to God's standards. And stop allowing your sins or your rebellious to be an excuse to keep you in a place of rebellion. Jesus Christ broke the curse of sin, of, 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 of the law of sin and death and set us free. Guess what? You're free. You don't have to be bound to rebellion. You don't have to be bound to the old mindset, the way of living. You can walk in the truth of God's word and freedom by the spirit of the living God. It is not enough to reach a certain plateau and think I've gone far as I'm going to go. We must be obedient in all things, not holding back anything or keeping any door in our lives closed to the Lord. That is so important as a child of God. Don't get to the place where you're holding back anything that's of a secret sin in your life. God wants everything that you have. He wants you to give it up to him. Everything about your life, God wants you to lay it at his feet. Cast your cares upon him, for he cares for you. And I guarantee God will begin to change, restruct, redirect your life, change your focus from a place of going into darkness, into a place of light, coming out of captivity into the place of victory in Christ Jesus. We all have certain areas that we hang on to as long as possible. But I exhort you to remember that a little leaven leavens the entire lump. And that scripture is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. And what that's talking about is a little sin in your life will cause you to mess up your entire destiny. Isn't that something how our future, our destiny is, 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 is attached to our obedience? If I can't obey God, how can I expect God to lead me to his promises he has for my life that I can receive the blessings and favor on my life if I keep on being disobedient? God blesses those who obey him. He blesses those who are going to follow his orders and decrees. Who's going to stand fast in the liberty Christ made you free. Them the ones that God blesses. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 6 it says like this. It says your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Verse 7, purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may have a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover lamb is sacrificed for us. In the message translation, it says it like this. Your flip and callous arrogance in these things bother me. You pass it off as a small thing, but it's anything but that. Yeast. Two is a small thing, but it works its way through the whole batch of bread dough petty, pretty fast. So get rid of this yeast. Our, our true identity is flat and plain, not puffed up with wrong kind of ingredients. The Messiah, our Passover lamb, has already been sacrificed for the Passover meal, and we are unable, and we are the unraised bread part of the feast. So in other words, you're not arrogant, you're not puffed up, you're not haughty, you're not stubborn, you're humble, you're submissive, you're yielding to the will of God for your life. God wants obedience, not sacrifice. 1 Samuel chapter 15. God said to his king Saul, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offering and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as idolatry, and teraphim. Household good, good luck images. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. First Samuel chapter 15, verse 22 and 23. An examination of Saul's life shows us vividly that he was given an opportunity to be king. He did not remain, did not maintain the position for a long time because of stubbornness and rebellion. He had his own idea about things. 
One time when Samuel the prophet was correcting Saul for not doing what he had been instructed to do, Saul replied was, I thought. Then he proceeded to express his idea of how he thought things should have been done. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 6 through 8. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 6 through 8. In chapter 13, verse 8 through 14, you read those scriptures when you get a chance. Samuel's answer, King Saul, was, let me read this again, excuse me. Samuel answered to King Saul was that God desires obedience and not sacrifice. If we think too much, we can reason our way out of God's will. That had never happened. make things manifest in your life according to his word and you disobey God, God is not playing games with us. Your excuses is not good enough. I don't know why this thing is messing up the way it is tonight. Your excuse is not good enough. Samuel confronted King Saul about his disobedience to the Lord, and King Saul had an excuse. Often we don't want to do what God asks, and then we attempt to do something to compensate for our disobedience. That is so true. We don't want to do what God tells us to do, but then we want to compensate our own doing with an excuse to justify our disobedience. If God told you to come out of a certain place hanging around a certain group of people, get out of a, a messed up relationship, and you stay in those things, and you try to justify it, your excuse is not good enough. How many of the children of God fail to reign as kings in life? Romans chapter 5, verse 17. Revelation chapter 1, verse 6. Romans chapter 5, verse 17. And Revelation chapter 1, verse 6. Because of their stubbornness and rebellion, so we can't make excuses to justify our wrongdoings. We got to obey God's word. We got to follow his instructions. We got to do what he says to do and allow God to handle the details. The instructions in the book, the instructions to the book of Ecclesiastes in, in Amplified Bible says this, the purpose of this book is to investigate life as a whole and to teach that in the final analysis, life is meaningless without proper respect and reverence for God. So the word of God in the book Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes, it tells us that the book to life is to investigate the whole life. And that's exactly what happens. God's word is in place to examine your heart, to examine your life, to see if you're going to follow his instructions, going to walk in obedience, walk in the path we has chosen for you, and to stay online on track what God has given you to do. A lot of times, and I found this out in my own personal life when I was young in ministry, I wasn't pliable when it came to the Word of God because I was read what I want to read and that was just it and then try to preach a message and it never worked out the way God wanted to be because I wasn't being, being sincere. That's what I'm looking for, excuse me. I wasn't being sincere in my own heart to make the word applicable to my heart. So I'm just saying some words because it sounds good. A lot of times when God tells you to minister to somebody and you don't want to do it, guess what you're going to do? You're going to tell them what, what they want to hear. You're not going to tell them what the Spirit of God tells you to, to speak to that person. Why? Because you don't want to hurt their feelings. I have found out in my own life that to obey God is better than being a, a sacrifice of disobedience. King Saul found out he should obey the voice of the prophet, what God told him to do, and not follow his own mindset, his own ideas, because it cost him his kingship. We are in the same position today. The life that we live, the word tells us we live by the faith of the Son of God who gave his life for us. So if Christ gave his life for you, guess what? He's living his life inside of you. And the Holy Spirit will guide you to all truth and have you speak what God says to speak to individuals, a word that's going to change their life. We can't hold back the promises of God's word when God says to speak into a person's life to help get them to a place of conviction where their lives will change. You don't have the
the right to justify what to say and what not to say. You have to walk in obedience, be surrendered to the Holy Spirit's leadership, and allow him to speak for you and through you. And the Holy Spirit himself will speak just what the person needs to hear to change their mindsets. A lot of people are stuck in a cycle of conditions because the mindset is stuck in rebellion. A lot of people are stuck in the cycle of systems of the mindset, of the old mindset, the worldly mentality, because they refuse to obey God's word. You have the right to change your life by submitting to God and his authority and his lordship and allowing them to come into your heart. And I tell you, when you do this, God will clean you up. He'll purify you. He'll put his fire inside of you, give you desire to want to obey God, walk in truth, be a witness, tell everybody about Jesus. The only thing Jesus told his disciples when he was about to go away was go into the world and baptize all men, teach them, to, teach them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. He said, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost and make disciples of men. Why? Because he knew that the mission of receiving the Holy Spirit was to go and share the good news of the gospel, to let people know what Christ has done for them. And because of that, that's our assignment today, to go into the world, baptize uh, all, all men by the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, make disciples of men, and tell the world about Jesus Christ, and allow that word to get into our hearts and change our lives. And I tell you, when you do that, the Holy Spirit himself will speak for you, will change your life forever. In Matthew chapter 28, <clears throat> verse 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, teaching to observe all things that I commanded you, and what I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of this world. Why? Because the gospel has to be preached to change people's lives. People are not going to change until they hear the gospel. The gospel is what's going to help bring life into a dead thing. It's going to bring light in a place of darkness. It's the gospel. The gospel when it brings a revelation from the heart of God to somebody who's in darkness, it causes the scales to fall from their eyes and their ears to become unstopped where they can hear God's voice speaking to them. Because God knows the heart of person. He knows the heart of man. He knows what's going to draw you and what's going to drive you. But we have to be willing to be those vessels to do what God says to do, to speak the truth. And I tell you, when you do that, you'll find such a joy and excitement in your heart. Being a witness for Jesus Christ. Helping somebody else change their life. Amen. Glory to God in the highest. We must understand that without obedience, there's no proper respect and reverence. We must understand that without obedience, there is no proper respect and reverence. The rebellion shown by many children today is caused by a lack of proper respect and reverence for their parents. for the parents. This is often the fault of the parents because they have not lived in front of their children a life that would evoke respect and reverence. Glory to God. So if you have rebellious children in your life and you and they, they are not following your instructions, not being obedient, not respecting you, check yourself. Because if you haven't taught your children how to respect authority and the reverence of authority, you can't blame nobody but yourself. Because you are the ones that's supposed to be their guide, their instructor, and their leaders, and direct them in a way of truth and righteousness. And if you don't do what God says to do, how can you expect them to follow the truth of God's word? That's Matthew chapter 18, verse 18. Not Matthew 18, 8. Matthew 18, 18. So you have to learn how to pay attention 
and speak the words of God in your children and while they're little, to train them up in the way they should go, that when they're old, they will not depart from it. Many children are not going to walk in obedience, going to be always haughty, rebellious, stubborn, miserable, angry, bitter, because of the way they're being raised up in their homes. A lot of children are being hurt in their homes, so they go out in the street and act it out because of the way they're treated at home. So we have to be careful how we treat our children and allow the Spirit of God to give you stern instructions on how to raise them up, even as a single parent. You can receive wisdom and knowledge from the Word of God on how to raise a child up in the things of God. Amen, amen. Most scholars agree with the book Ecclesiastes was written by King Solomon, who was more, who was given more wisdom from God than any other man. If Solomon had so much wisdom, how could he have made so many mistakes in his life? The answer is simple. It is possible to have something and not use it. We have the mind of Christ, but we do not always use it. Jesus has been made unto us wisdom from God, but we do not always use wisdom. Why? Because we lean on our own intellect. When we lean on our own intellect, you, re you rebel against God's truth, and you become stubborn, and don't listen to the voice of God, and follow his instructions. <laughs> Solomon wanted to go on his own way, and do his own things. He spent his life trying the first, first one thing, and then another. He had he had anything and everything that money could buy, the best of every worldly pleasure. And yet, this is what he said in his conclusion of the book. All that have been heard, the end of the matter is, fear God, revere and worship him, knowing that he is, and keep his commandments. For this is the whole of man, the full original purpose of creation, the object of God's providence and the root of character, the foundation of all happiness, the adjustment to all inharmonious circumstances and conditions under the sun, the, and the whole duty for every man. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. So, in everything you gain in life, everything you do in life, the conclusion is to fear God and keep his commandments. You got to follow God's instructions. Got to follow God's leadership in order to live right and live righteous in this world. Let me put in my own words what I received from the scriptures. The whole purpose of man's creation is that he reverence and worship God by obeying him. That's, that's the whole root, root, root right there of conclusion is to obey God and follow his commands. All godly character must be rooted in obedience. It is the foundation of all happiness. No one can ever be truly happy without being obedient to God. You know what I just said? You cannot be truly happy unless you're being obedient to God. Anything in our lives that is out of order will be brought into to adjustment by obedience. Anything in our lives that is out of order will be brought into the adjustment by obedience. Obedience is the whole duty of man. Amen. As far as I'm concerned, this is one of the awesome scriptures. I encourage you to continue studying it on your own. Obedience and disobedience both have consequences. Obedience and disobedience both have consequences. For as, for as by one man's disobedience, Many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Romans chapter 5, verse 19. Romans chapter 5, verse 19. For by one man's disobedience, talking about Adam, in the beginning in the garden, everybody was made sinners. When Adam decided to rebel against God in the garden of Eden and sin and, just, and not follow God's word, guess what happened? We all became sinners. But by Christ Jesus, the sacrifice that he made on the cross, he gave us the right 
to become righteous. And because of what he's done, all are made righteous when you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in your life. Our choice to obey or not to obey not only affects us, but multitudes of others. You hear that? Our choice does not affect us, but also affects other people. Just think of it. If the Israelites had promptly obeyed God, how much greater their lives would have been. Many of them and their children died in the wilderness because they would not submit to God's ways. Their children were affected by their decisions, and so are ours. Our decisions that we choose to disobey God not only affects our lives, but it affects everyone connected to us. And because of this, we all fall short of the glory of God. Amen. Your decision to obey God affects other people. Your decision affects other people. When you decide to disobey, that also affects others. You may disobey God and choose to stay in the wilderness. But please keep in mind that if you now have or have ever had children, your decision will keep them in the wilderness with you. That's deep. You being disobedient not only affect you, but it keeps your children in disobedience. They may manage to get themselves out when they are grown, but I can assure you that, you that they will pay a price for your disobedience. So whatever you do with your life is going to affect your children attached to you. Not only will it affect them, but it affects their future. So in other words, their future is attached to your obedience or your disobedience as a parent. So it's, it's your decision to instill in them godly wisdom and godly truth or let them live their life watching rap music and listening to R&B, all these different things that are out in the world that entice people to sin, keep letting them do, uh, gravitate to those things, it's going to affect their life. But you can change that by starting as when they're children to train them in the, in the way of God's order, the way of truth and righteousness, and God will do the rest. Your life might be in a better shape now if someone in your past had obeyed God. Your life would be in a better place. Obedience is far-reaching things. It closes the gate of hell and opens the window of heaven. Obedience closes the gates of hell in your life and it opens the windows of heaven. So you have to make a decision in your life. I'm going to follow God's truth. I'm going to put on the full armor of God keep standing on the word or I'm going to keep on living my life the way I choose to live and, and suffer the consequences because there are consequences to all of my actions. One thing I found out just because I get born again doesn't mean I'm not going to face the responsibility of consequences for my actions. Everything I've done in the past there are consequences but God gives you the grace to carry through those consequences to lead a victorious life that's found in knowing him. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5. It's been our key scripture for the whole book. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5. Bring every thought to captivity to Christ. For the weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of the flesh and blood, but they're mighty before God for the overthrow and destruction of strongholds. And as much as we, be few arguments and theories and reasons and every proud and lofty thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God and lead every thought and purpose away captive into the obedience of Christ the Messiah, the anointed one. Our thoughts are what gets us into trouble quite often. Our thoughts are what gets us into trouble quite often. And I'm sure you can agree with that. If you take the time and sit down and evaluate yourself, you find out a lot of situations you got in was because of the way you was thinking. And God has the ability, God has the remedy to set you free from that thought life. But you got to be willing to give it up. In Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8. 
For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. No matter what you think, God has written his thoughts down in the book called the Bible. No matter what you do, what you think, God's word is written in the Bible for you and for me. We must choose to examine our thoughts in the light of God's word. Always being willing to submit our thoughts to his thoughts, knowing that he knows what's best for us. So the more I submit my thoughts to God's thoughts and allow God's thoughts to dominate my thoughts, God leads me by the way of truth and the way of righteousness. He leads me in divine order. So the sins and addictions and the habits and strongholds and troubles we face in our life, guess what? His thoughts will overpower the thoughts of the enemy every time you surrender to his lordship. This is exactly the point made in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5. Examine what is in your mind. If it does not agree with God's thoughts, the Bible, then cast down your own thoughts and think on his. So if your thoughts your reasonings doesn't line up with God's word, give it to God and let him take over. And I guarantee when he takes over, he will give you the victory. People living in vanity in their own minds not only destroy themselves, but far too often they bring destruction to others around them. People living in a futile mindset, a sinful mindset, not only destroy themselves or hurt other hurt themselves, they're hurting other people with the way they think. Just like working on a job, and you go to work, and they give you an assignment, and they give you instructions how to complete the assignment, and everyone is waiting for you to complete the assignment, and you don't do it, and you're in a team, you hurt the whole team, because everyone has to participate and do their part to make the company successful. But if you don't do your part, you cause everybody else to fail. And God is saying tonight, no matter what's in your mind, your mind is a battlefield. But you have to choose the ground. Either you're going to win or you're going to lose the war that Satan launched against you. It's your choice. And as you make a decision, it's very important to have a heartfelt prayer, to cast down every imagination and every high and lofty thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity into the obedience of Jesus Christ. So when you get to the place where you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, let God have your mind. Let God replace your thought life with his thoughts. Let God replace your life with his life. So the life that you live will be a victorious life, an abundant life, a loving, peaceful life, resting in the finished work of the cross that Christ has accomplished for us when he paid the price on Calvary's cross to bring us redemption. So everything that was in that package is all for you. The fruitfulness, the abundance of peace, the love, the joy, the righteousness, the long suffering, the goodness, the gentleness, the faithfulness. Everything that Christ has done is for you. And because of the obedience, that's when we gravitate the promises into our lives and the blessings and the prosperity. We get to manifest in your life the moment you make a decision, I'm going to walk in obedience according to God's word. I pray that this book has helped you, has given you some insight concerning your thought life. If you have this book, go back and read it again. And I guarantee when you read this book, God's going to give you another revelation, a deeper revelation concerning the book that you can apply to your own personal life. We have completed the book, The Balance of the Mind. I'm so excited. I thank the Lord for this opportunity to teach this book. And I pray that you continue to grow in grace and knowledge who God is in your life. Because one thing about the devil, he doesn't want you to learn anything, any strategies or anything that's going to defeat him. But when you learn the truth about yourself and the power that you have at your disposal, guess what? You overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. Because greater is he 
that's in you than he that's in the world. So, Lord, I thank you tonight for this word that's going across the airways. I pray, oh God, that bring a change in the lives of those that heard this word, to cause them to study your word, to get to know you for themselves, oh God, and begin to allow their lives to be changed by the word of God. Forgive us, oh God, for our sins and iniquities. And I pray, oh God, that you wash it in the blood of the Lamb and purify our thoughts tonight, oh God, that we have the God thoughts and no longer have our sinful thoughts. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So if you're here tonight, you don't know Jesus, your Lord and Savior, I encourage you to get to know him. The Bible tells us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. You can receive the new life in your heart tonight by praying this simple prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I acknowledge I am a sinner. Come into my heart, forgive me for my sins, knowingly unknowingly, and wash me in the blood of the Lamb. And be my Lord and Savior. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, you're now born again. And welcome to the family of God. And the whole host of heaven rejoices over one sinner who gave their life to Christ tonight. Amen. Again, I want to thank everyone for tuning out. I do apologize for this glitch. I don't know why the system kept messing up, kicking people out and cutting out and freezing up. I don't understand what Facebook is doing, but we got to pray for the airways because evidently it's a demonic attack to keep this word from going across. But nevertheless, we made it to the end of the book, and I give God the praise, the glory, and the honor, and I pray you stay excited about Jesus until next week. Lord said the same. We will convene again next week. Next week, Tuesday at 6 o'clock p.m. Spread the news. TNT. T Tuesday night Bible class. TNBC. TNBC, Tuesday night Bible class. We'll resume again on next week, Tuesday. The Lord says the same. You all have a great night. And may the Lord bless you. And may the Lord cause his face to shine and be gracious to you and turn his face towards you. And Lord, give you peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a good night.